um, so next up, um, well, we've just heard from an international company who, which has a growing presence in Australia. And well, we hope to see more and more of Rolls Royce here. But we must not forget that Australia also has domestic companies that are already working in specialized area of nuclear technologies. There's a number of them actually in the audience. Um, one of them is Entex, which was formerly known as FOSS Energy. And today we've got the head of uh, Entex, sorry, the, um, the managing director, sorry, Bryn, the managing director of Entex with Bryn. Oh, there you are, right at the back, uh, Bryn Jones. Um, Entex is a company that uh, works, uh, has many projects. Well, one of them that is particularly interesting to me is uh, uh, radioisotope heating units, units for space applications, and therefore also the capability to deal with uh, 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 radiation sources and therefore uh, radioactive waste. Um, I look forward to hearing more. Welcome to the stage. Thanks very much, Patrick, and, and thanks uh, thanks again to Michael and Edward for for, for really leading the charge on this uh, on this uh, uh, these events to really make sure that the industry doesn't uh, uh, ignore this problem that we've or this challenge that we've got coming up, I guess. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk briefly. As as um, Patrick said, we we recently changed rebranded it, I guess, from Foss Energy to Entex. Entex uh, we we think more broadly covers the scope of of projects that we're doing. Uh, I won't worry about the disclaimer. That's for the lawyers. Um, so I'll, I'll, very, I'll very brief, uh, wait, and, and just a bit of background on that. So we are a we're a, a public unlisted company. So we have around thirteen hundred shareholders in an unlisted company. So as you can imagine, we administratively have all the burdens of uh, running a public company, but none of the advantages in terms of access to capital, or easy access to capital, I guess. Um, so where we where why we were called Foss Energy and where we started was really. Uh, within the company called Uranium Equities, uh, we we developed we were uh, an exploration uranium development company. We started a technology um, in the US uh, to uh, extract uranium from phosphoric acid in the fertilizer industry. Hence, hence FOSS Energy. Um, the, a lot of people don't know that if you go into Bunnings and buy a bag of fertilizer that's produced in DAP fertilizer that's produced in Morocco or the US. Uh, you might have up to 50 types per million of uranium in that in that fertilizer, uh, and from a, on a worldwide basis, uh, there's around 20 million pounds a year floating around in phosphate fertilizer streams of uranium, so enough to power about an eighth of the world's nuclear fleet. Uh, so we developed a process in in partnership with Cameco, uh, the, the the Canadian uranium giant, obviously, and uh, with um, a, a US fertilizer producer to extract that uranium. Uh, and we worked on that through two pilot plants uh, and a couple of feasibility studies. Uh, and we, right on the Fukushima incident, we finished that work and then the bottom fell out of the uranium market for a decade. So that's obviously starting to come back now, but um, we are, uh, we, and that's, that's, that will become back, uh, will come back into the fore for us in the next little while in terms of, in terms of activity. But over the last decade, we, we started um, working on collecting other technologies that fit our skill set and, and really our broad narrative on uh, waste or underutilized resources uh, conversion into useful uh, energy or, or, or chemicals or other, other useful uh, products. So I'll, I'll jump around a bit here, but uh, the, the, when I was working on the FOSS energy process, I, uh, in, in, I was in Toronto and I got introduced to a, uh, a fellow Adelaidean that was living in Toronto, a guy named Julian Kelly, who quite a few of you here will probably, probably know. Uh, Julian um, immediately struck me his, uh, his his breadth of knowledge of the broad nuclear fuel industry, his passion for the industry, uh, and it really it really is his, his passion to learn whatever he didn't know about the industry very very quickly. So um, a couple of years later, uh, Julian moved to Adelaide to run the, the the technical aspects, I guess, of the Royal Commission into into the nuclear fuel cycle for the South Australian government. And uh, we um, started talking. I was, I was obviously living in Adelaide, and, and when Julian was, was uh, got, a, got a bit tired at the end of a week of, of dealing with lawyers and, and, and the, other, the other aspects of the a Royal Commission, he would come down to our engineering office and we'd sit around over a bottle of wine and solve the, solve the uh, problems of the world. Out, out of those discussions came our Carbon X technology, down, down the bottom here, uh, and our um, Gen X technology, both of which are a beta radiation-driven catalytic um, 
or, or semiconductor uh, projects. So um, CarbonX, this was in about 2016. So CarbonX, uh, we very quickly borrowed a radiation source from Jones and Partners, the medical radiation guys. We got a, 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 um, a semiconductor, we got some carbon dioxide in solution, and we quickly showed that we could beta catalyze the conversion of CO2 into other, other useful chemicals, methanol, formaldehydes, those, those sort of uh, analytes, excuse me. Uh, a couple of years later, uh, Jess at, at, at ANSO helped us out and, and ran, a, ran another program, a, a larger program. And so we, we drove, and what we're really aiming for there is to drive uh, a result that can tell us from a single beta decay, how many chemical conversions do we get? So uh, we got to the point where we were getting, at, in that work, we were getting about 40,000 chemical conversions per beta decay. So every, every beta emission is creating tens of thousands of electron hole pairs on the surface of a semiconductor. And that, that, those electrons are then being forced onto CO2, destabilizing and converting CO2 into other, other things. Uh, Gen X is a little bit different. Gen X is, is um, taking a, a similar idea, a high band gap semiconductor in a, um, in a semiconductor composite that can be rolled on a, on a sheet to sheet sort of basis, uh, incorporating a radioisotope again into that semiconductor layer and then having a set of electrodes that can provide an inherent electric field to harvest electrons created. So effectively a PV cell that doesn't need exposure to the sun. And so this obviously has some, some pretty obvious um, applications for uh, the space industry. As we get away further and further from the, from the sun, we need alternatives for how are we going to power um, satellites, uh, lunar rovers on the dark side of the moon, how, how are we going to do all this? So that's, that's been particularly exciting for us and we're starting to push into the defence space uh, with, that, with that particular technology as well. A spin out of that technology and, and obviously, uh, sorry, currently that... Um, we, we were awarded a, a CRCP grant last year on that, uh, on that technology and we're, we're working under that CRCP grant with University of South Australia, University of Adelaide and Uni WA. Um, Gen T is a, is a sort of spin out. So we take, we take that same structure, that same um, as, asymmetric uh, metal semiconductor, metal, metal semiconductor metal uh, structure. Uh, we put a very low band gap semiconductor into the structure this time and waste heat effectively, industrial heat at 400 odd degrees, will create electron hole pairs in that semiconductor. Again, same, same theory, we harvest, we harvest waste heat, convert it into electricity in, at some efficiency and uh, uh, recycle it into process. Uh, lastly, uh, just to cover off the technologies is the, is the radiation heater unit Patrick mentioned. And this, this has been, to date, been working under a Australian Space Agency Moon to Mars uh, grant, demonstrator grant. Um, working with Mark Ho at Oronos, who did some fantastic work for us, um, and, and also working with um, Moonload, which is a, uh, I guess, a thermal uh, management company in, uh, in Adelaide dedicated to the space industry. So getting back to what we're talking about here, skills, and there's a, there's a really big list there, we won't go through them all, but um, you'll see a couple of common, common factors in there. Uh, semiconductor physics, obviously, um, Nuclear, uh, sorry, uh, nuclear transformations. Uh, obviously, if we're manufacturing isotopes, we, we need to understand how to do that, where to do that. Um, I think uh, thin, thin film deposition comes up pretty pretty regularly for us. And then these, obviously, these very broad skills, which we don't want to forget about in this in this area, which is radiation management and and radiation handling competence, which is which is built. And and this this sort of skill set, which I think. I think we were talking is really the mentoring type type skill set we were talking about earlier. Really, we've we've created this delightful acronym for it down here, which is uh, really just understanding what materials are where in the nuclear industry. How do you make them? Who do you go to to talk about how to make them? Uh, those those sort of skill sets, which is obviously probably unfairly represented in this room, but you go outside of this room and there's there's probably it's pretty thin on the ground. So in terms of our people. Um, Obviously, obviously, myself, my background is more in the in the in the resources industry, uh, but in technology development in terms of process technology development. Um, Julian, obviously, uh, some very very relevant skill sets at Ansto, Thor, Thor Energy, where he did uh, um, nuclear fuel uh, work on uh, on um, thorium-based fuels, obviously, 
uh, Advanced Cell is a medical isotope company and, and CSIRO. Um, again, Macy de los Reyes, uh, pretty energetic. Most of you met Macy, wouldn't forget Macy. She's a lovely, lovely uh, person and, uh, and a, a very, very curious and sharp mind. Um, her background, again, Ansto figures heavily in there. Um, and, then, and then we've gone, well, we've got a lot of sort of fundamental skills in research and, and ceramics and material science at that end. What do we need to fill up that sort of middle gap of how do we take some of these technologies and commercialise them? So we've, we've actually pinched a couple of guys from the automotive industry. And, and again, to, your, to, to the point about mentoring, we've, we're putting them in exposure, so an existing very valuable skill set in exposure to to Julian and Macy and others that can that can actually transfer some of those more uh, nuclear industry skills, uh, and then we've got a couple of guys from the energy industry um, feeding our, our our hydrogen project, which we haven't really talked about, but probably not particularly relevant. And of course, we're, we're, we're obviously we're a relatively small team. Um, that's the technical team. We have a we have a uh, usual office back office support, but in terms of our um, our partners, obviously we, we're a small team. We can't do this on our own. So who do we work with? Uh, University of South Australia, the Future Industries Institute out there has been fantastic. Um, the Adelaide University, Nigel Spooner's group in the, in, in Adelaide University. Um, Duke Systems, which is now rebadged as um, Ascension, is a, uh, uh, an electronic warfare company and they're, they're, they have some, some interest in our, in our projects from, from an application perspective. Uh, Durama is a... Um, is a polymer company, so they're they're actually helping us out with with um, making our semiconductors for our for our technologies formable into thin films and uh, processable in a in a roll to roll environment, borrowing technology from the battery industry. Um, University of Western Australia helping us out with heat management and electrical engineering on our on our devices, uh, and and Ansto can't obviously can't forget about Ansto. I'm well, actually I was just reflecting when I was putting this slide together that I'm I'm on. Four public boards at the moment, including three ASX listed companies. Every single one of them has an active project with Ansto at the moment, which is which I think is pretty amazing. I hadn't thought about that until I was putting this slide together. So, um, uh, where do we? And this is going to be really hard to read at this scale. But um, what what have we got? Pretty well covered. You see that sort of yellow color, yellow color. We think for the work we're doing right at the moment, we're pretty well covered. Um, what are we developing? The sort of white, oops, sorry, that was the wrong one. The sort of white colour here. Uh, what are we? What are we developing? Um, and uh, where do we? Where do we have gaps at the moment? So, um, if you look at that in terms of where do we have gaps, you know, there's 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 a lot of gaps there. Um, and how are we going to fill those? Well, we have we have currently this this uh, coming year uh, 20, 2023 we'll have two uh, graduates um, in in most likely material science and physics uh, we'll have we'll be sponsoring two PhDs uh, at um, one at uh, RMIT uh, and one at Adelaide University and we will be um, uh, we are working with the uh, ANU UniSA. Uh, Uni Adelaide Training Centre uh, that's, that's in proposal at the moment to build these types of nuclear skills, probably more tilted towards the medical industry, but um, building building these skill sets, which we are excited about. That's about all I've got, mate. Sorry, mate. Oh, just just briefly on the on the on the on the board and and these guys have been incredibly supportive over the over the last ten years uh, that we've been running uh, Foss Energy now Entex. Um, and part of the reason why we get great shareholder support, if any of you are punters in the resource industry, you'll recognise Tim Goiter there. He had, I think he had two of the best performing stocks on the ASX last year, or the, the two best performing stocks on the ASX last year at 750% each being Chalice and Liontown. Uh, so he's obviously very well followed in the, uh, in the, in the public markets, um, which, is, which, is, which is why we get great support in terms of our funding efforts. Uh, so, yeah, thanks very much.